folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, and especially that most wonderful, wonderful genre, uh, steampunk. <laughs> of course, what else? Uh, today, in memory of the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, I wanted to do something very British. And uh, so I'm going to talk about a quintessentially British fantasy writer, and it's not J.R.R. Tolkien, it's his good friend C.S. Lewis. Clive Staples Lewis, author of the beloved Narnia series, and he lived from 1898 to 1963. And interesting fact, he died on the very same day that JFK was assassinated, November 22nd. Uh, anyway, um, C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast, in Ireland, but he was of English descent. And at that time, you know, all of Ireland was ruled by England. And he died in Oxford, England. And, again, he is one of the most famous British fantasy writers, probably second most after, after Tolkien, and, as, as I said, writer of the beloved Chronicles of Narnia series. Although he wrote over 30 books and zillions of essays, and, and they've, been, they've been, according to Wikipedia, translated into more than 30 languages. He was a devout Christian, and it shows in his books. Uh, some of the, his essays were spe specifically religious essays. And uh, I had never read his stuff as a, as a kid, because I guess, you know, over here on the American side of the pond, uh, we weren't quite, didn't get quite into Narnia until later. And so it really wasn't a famous kid's book in America in my childhood. But it is, it is a good series. And so I had never read it, and I, and, uh, although we'd seen the movie in 2005, and I hadn't really, it wasn't one of those books that I bought for my son. But I got interested in it because, well, partly because I read some essays by John C. Wright, who's a, um, a Christian science fiction writer, former, former atheist like, just like Lewis. <laughs> uh, and uh, so he feels a real kinship, and he wrote a number of essays, some of which uh, he really brags up the works of Lewis. So, so I, I thought, yeah, I should check these out. And so I checked, I read um, Out of the Silent Planet, which is his, one of his sci-fi stories. And uh, very interesting, very kind of wacky science, because I think it was written in the 1920s. Uh, very Victorian in that sense. And uh, the Narnia series, which I like better, they were uh, part of an audio book by Audible, a special deal, seven British uh, actors reading the seven Narnia books. It's really great, highly recommended. Patrick Stewart, my personal favorite, reading the last one. Now, Narnia was written seven books over seven years, uh, out of chronological order, uh, but uh, one per year, 1950 through 1956. And in general, the major characters are the Pevensies, the Pevensey kids, uh, two brothers, two sisters, and uh, they appear in the first book that was published, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and which was actually the second in chronological order. And uh, this was made into a movie in 2005, uh, a collaboration between Disney and Walt Media. And uh, I, later on, I didn't see these, but I guess they've been done, Prince Caspian in 2008 and John, Voyage of the Dawn Treader in 2010, which did very well. I, I don't think Lewis had much trouble getting these published, but in, nowadays I think he would. Because, I mean, Christian books, I think you have to be in the Christian publishing industry. You, you, you couldn't be mainstream anymore because there's kind of an anti-Christian bias in uh, modern American culture and British as well. And the Christian publishing industry is kind of, kind of very biblical in its view, and if you don't fit into that, you probably don't fit, which which um, Lewis's stuff wouldn't. One of the reasons I like it, because it's a little different. Uh, and the famous writer Madeline Langle, and this was back in the 60s, she had trouble publishing A Wrinkle in Time, because it had religious themes, but it was very, very um, unconventional religious themes. I mean, not, you know, satanic or anything like that, but, but not biblical, let's say. And even the biblical ones she later wrote, wrote later were weird. <laughs> And those I did get for my son. Uh, so, about about uh, about Narnia. First of all, real real quick summary of Narnia. Narnia is a magical land 
that um, is kind of a parallel universe. And the Pevensey children first encounter it when they're up in northern England. This is during World War II, during the Blitz, and they sent a lot of the kids out so they'd be safe from the Nazi bombings. And in, they were at the estate of a eccentric uncle, and there they went, at playing hide-and-seek, the youngest girl uh, went, into the, uh, went into a wardrobe, and she found that there was no back end in it. She was going to hide. She found there was no back end in it, and she kept going into a forest, and she encounters a fawn, Mr. Tumnus, and, and has tea with him and stuff like that. And so she tells her siblings when she gets out, and they don't believe her, of course, but eventually they go back in, they uh, live in Narnia for years in Narnia time, and they become kings and queens, and when they come back out into the real world, uh, no time has passed at all. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a very fun children's story, and, and uh, as, I, as I've noted, he, ha he has a very clever and enduring writing style. And interestingly enough, his books also inspired Phil Pullman to do the the uh, Dark Material series, which is the anti Narnia. I mean, he found Pullman found some of the religious themes in uh, Narnia off-putting, and he decided to write a counter series, and uh, most famous being the Golden Compass. I actually like them both, and they both have their good and bad parts. It's interesting in John C. Wright's essays, he really trashes Pullman, of course. <laughs> uh, and but and he's got a good point. The third book, you know isn't as good as the others. I will review those at some point. I mean, I'll talk about those at some point. They'll be out, but not forever, just like the, the Narnia stuff. But it bears, I mean, it's, they're, they're classics, so they bear talking about. So there are a lot of elements in the Narnia stories that would be problematic these days, I think, and from both from the Christian right and from the liberal left. First of all, you've got the idea of Jesus being a lion, which I found really bizarre when I first heard about that. He's Aslan the lion. And he's he's like the not really the ruler, but he's kind of he's kind of the Messiah of Narnia, and he appears now and then to help out the children, but you know he never does too much for them. Uh, well, except in one case uh, from the first book, but uh, he is very he does very Christ-like things, but it just seems weird to to um, cast uh, the Prince of Peace as a scary carnivore. <laughs> um, there's a lot of there's a lot of pagan elements in, in Narnia, which I think the fundamentalists these days would hate, you know, fawns and dryads and naiads and all that stuff, and uh, I think that makes it more fun. Um, but uh, and it's the, and uh, you know it's just it's just pagan. It doesn't mean it's anti-Christian, but you know a lot of fundamentalists think, oh, that's satanic. <laughs> I think they're wrong. Uh, the idea of talking animals is another interesting thing in Narnia, which is not necessarily the problem, but there's talking animals and there's dumb animals that don't talk. Most of them don't. But Aslan at the beginning assigns a bunch of animals to be t talking, and so they're smart as humans. And they are like equal with humans, and the other animals aren't. So I think a lot of, uh, you know, bunny hugger uh, PETA types would have trouble with that, because they still, people still eat animals in Narnia. It's not, they just don't eat the talking ones. And they still ride horses, but they they don't ride the talking horses without permission. <laughs> you have to request, you have to ask them nicely. Uh, so, um, another thing, interesting thing in, in Narnia is that they have, in a couple of the stories, they have Middle Easterner types called Kalorman. They're the bad guys in a couple of these stories. And they're very much like Arabs, although they're not Islamic. They have a pagan religion that they follow. Uh, so, and they drink wine. So it's like, you know, it's not so... It's not so specifically pro a problem, but I, but you know, the Muslims. There are many Muslims who are so sensitive that I have a problem that they're. I have the idea that a lot of them would have a problem with this. Uh, there's a, a strong criticism of modern, of modern education, which I loved. <laughs> uh, one of the stories mentions a place called Experiment House, which sounds truly awful. <laughs> All these modern educational theories. And uh, then the, end, the uh, ending of the final battle, no, the last battle, the seventh book, is kind of disturbing to modern sensibilities. And so, and I wasn't my favorite either, so a lot of people wouldn't like that. But take it as it would, as you will. Uh, so, do a summary of each of uh, the seven books. And uh, kind of show what I liked the best. Although I didn't really, it was hard to pick. 
I mean, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think, is most people's favorite. It wasn't my favorite, because being written the first, I think, it the most, had the most childish style. And, and the style, he kind of upped the ante, upped the grade level a little bit as he went, went along. One of the funniest things in that book is that Mr. Thomas the Fawn, at one point, he is guilty about betraying the Pevensey kids, and he, and he starts saying, I'm a bad fawn! And he starts weeping, and it's so funny. Uh, it, it, but it's silly, you know. So, my favorite is probably A Horse and His Boy, just for the title alone, and because it's got some different characters. And it's pretty much from the uh, pretty much from the viewpoint of a talking horse, which makes it which makes it fun. And by the way, I have yet to try Turkish Delight, which is the uh, dessert that plays a big role in the first the first book, I mean the first published book, uh, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. A lot of people say it's gross. Uh, what do you guys think? Have you had Have you had it? I I don't even know where I'd find it. I I, I definitely need to try it sometime. But every one of these books has something I love. I love Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in the first book. They're this, the, the quintessential English couple. What do you think, Mrs. Beaver? Well, Mr. Beaver, I think. You know, they, that's the way they talk. I like the bratty Eustace Scrub, who was the Pevensey's cousin. He starts out as a coward and a entitled little sniveling, uh, sniveling jerk. And he becomes a heroic and, and uh, he becomes a heroic and loving character. I like P Puddle Glum, the gloomy Marsh Wiggle, which I think Marsh Wiggle is kind of like a frogman person, <laughs> and he's he's so pessimistic he makes he makes uh, Eeyore look like a ray of sunshine. And finally, there's Shift the Ape, who was the the big scammer in the last book, the fi the last battle, and he has a he creates a religious hoax. Uh, more about that later. So here's here's the seven books in order of publication. Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, that's the famous one, where the children first enter Narnia. That was made in a movie in 2005. Uh, highly successful. Prince Caspian, in which the Pevensey children return to Narnia, Narnia to help a boy who's been robbed of his throne. Uh, and uh, Voyage, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, in which the two younger uh, Pevenseys, Lucy and Edmund, and the cousin used to scrub, uh, re get into Narnia to seek the seven lost lords of, seven lost lords of Narnia, who had left when the witch was in, in control, and they're trying to get them back. And uh, Eustace is complaining all the time, which is kind of funny. It's a sea battle, a sea voyage, and he's always seasick and stuff. Uh, the silver chair, in which Eustace and his, his classmate Jill help find the missing son of King Caspian. That was Prince Caspian, now he's a king. A horse and his boy, in which a talking horse and, a, and an abused adopted boy flee the Kaloraman, and that boy is actually a prince in uh, uh, one of the neighboring countries of uh, Narnia. The Magician's Nephew, which is the prequel, it's actually the first in, in chronological order, where Aslan creates, uh, creates Narnia, and basically the eccentric uncle from The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, he is a young man in this one. He goes into Narnia, and he encounters the White Witch, and he sees you know, Narnia being created, and so on. Which It's kind of, it's kind of cool the way... Uh, the way uh, Lewis does this. Finally, there's the last battle, which is the Narnian Apocalypse. My favorite thing about that is that Ship the Ape creates this religious uh, scam in which he dresses a donkey as Aslan and, and, is getting, and is forcing people to work for him as his slaves because Aslan, the donkey, will be angry. And I, I love that uh, as a religious man, uh, Lewis could say, you know, some people abuse Christianity. Some people use it for nefarious purposes. And I like that he could admit that. At the same time, I, it bugged me because I didn't like to see Narnia end. Because uh, I didn't see a, a compelling reason for Narnia to end. Uh, but, uh, oh well, the series had to end somehow. So, those are the seven. And I highly recommend them. I think they're good kids' books. I mean, they're a little bit on the mature side. There's battles. The kids fight in battles. Uh, sometimes a lot of people will be bothered by that, uh, but you know if you're if you're pretty open-minded and the kids aren't super young, I think they're a good series for children, and I highly recommend that audiobook series. Um, the audiobook, well, it's a single audiobook, which is quite a deal, with the British actors reading reading stuff. It's excellent. So this has been my show about the classic series, uh, the Chron Chronicles of Narnia 
written by the uh, great Clive Staples Lewis, the renowned British fantasy writer. And uh, my take on it, uh, please let me know in the comments below what you think, uh, what you think about Narnia. If you haven't seen Narnia, you know, if you don't know anything about Narnia, you should at least check it out. And you know, Narnia versus versus uh, Golden Compass. And that is another theme. So please like and subscribe. Uh, that helps us get up the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.